So glad to see my Southwestern brothers. That was so wonderful. Hallelujah, Lord, we're singing high. Don't you know that I've been running every since I made a start? Oh, you know that my 
days are shining And Jesus is gonna make mine You make them lighter I say love I say the love yeah. And I say the love is a bubbling over I made a star. Oh, you know that my days are brighter. Jesus gonna make my, you make them lighter. I say love. Oh, and I say the love. Yeah, and I say the love bubbling over here in my. Since I made a star, oh, you know that my days are brighter. Can Jesus gonna make mine? You make them lighter. I say love is a bubbling. I say that love is a bubbling. I say oh, that love is a bubbling. I say that love is a bubbling. I said that love is a bubbling over in my heart. Oh, I say glory, hallelujah. I say glory, hallelujah. Don't you know that I've been running every since I made a start? Oh, in my love, my days are brighter. Lighter, I say love. Oh, and I say the love. Oh, and I say the love. Yeah, I say the love. In over in my heart, in my heart. Amen. Amen. Good morning, good morning. We're glad to see each one that have come out this morning. And to those that are at home, online, we welcome you to the service this morning. We say get up, though. Get dressed like you're coming to church. Put your makeup on. Put your ties on. And lace up your shoes. Even though you're at home, look like you're going to the Lord's house. And I think the Lord would truly, truly be glad. We have uh, Brother Marson is in Houston this morning. So let's pray that he make a safe trip as well as a safe return. And Cedric, Deacon Cedric, I thought we we're going to be doing all of this, but he's out. We want to pray for him that things might get better and his health and everything. But we got a few announcements we're going to make. Uh, our Wednesday night Zoom class that begins at 7 p.m. We will have a guest speaker this week, and our guest speaker comes to us from the Greenville Avenue congregation, Brother Randy Clark Sr. He will be our guest speaker on our Zoom class on Wednesday night. The Gospel Hour Chorus uh, is scheduled a reunion. Chorus rehearsal is scheduled for February the 18th. We have two seats. Guess what, y'all? We're going to... Dr. Phil. We're going to be on Dr. Phil's show. February 20th. About 50 of us are scheduled to go and be on the Dr. Phil show. Now, it's very important if you hadn't got your form and fill your form out. Now, it don't take a whole lot. Know your name, know your address, I think, and that's about it. But you need to get those back into our office administrator. And uh, cause we going, they're gonna send a bus or something to pick us up. 
as long as y'all hold to that number 50 now. If you drop off, we might have to drive. So we want the bus to pick us up. So we want everyone to sign up to please, please go. Now, if you know a week ahead of time, I'm not going to be able to make Please let the office administrator know because we need to find a replacement for you. Uh, pictures today. The ushers, uh, Southwestern Christian College alumni, and the education department and the worship team will all be taking group pictures where we're getting ready for our 100th anniversary. And y'all know what? 25 days from now, we start. Celebrate our 100th anniversary. And it's going to be a glorious month for the month of March. Now, we want all of our members to be a part. Now, the luncheon tickets, uh, let, me, let me make sure I read this right. Luncheon tickets deadline is today. Those $65 for the luncheon, your parking is included. Now, if you need to sit, buy a ticket today, stand up, Sister Silver. Uh, stand up, uh, Kim, Hodge. And where is Sister Hodges at? Y'all all stand up. I see one, I see two. I know Kim, maybe she's in the foyer. But y'all purchase your ticket today. Now, if you're, if you're one of those that said, well, I don't get paid to the first of the month, but I really want to go, talk to one of these three. And they'll talk to me and, and Brother Mosley, and we'll see if we can make it happen. How is that? Or if you're one of those that said, well, I won't have no money to march till I file my income tax check. <laughs> talk to one of those three. They'll talk to Brother Mosley and myself, and we'll see if we can make it happen. How is that? I want to cover, I don't want to leave, give no one no excuse to why they can't attend our 100th anniversary luncheon at the Lowe's Anatole. Um, I don't see, is Brother Chambers here today? Brother L.C.? Brother L.C. celebrated, I believe it was on Friday, four score and two. Can y'all do the math? That's 82. 82 years old. So we said to Brother L.C. Chambers a late happy birthday and wish you many, many more. Don't forget uh, uh, Vision Sunday is next Sunday. Next Sunday is Super Bowl. Next Sunday is Vision Sunday. Next Sunday is a meeting after the Vision Sunday. Next Sunday is just a busy day, and then we can get home and we can watch the Super Bowl. So uh, we ask you to make sure you come and to stay for approximately 45 minutes to an hour after worship service on next Sunday so we can let you know what our plans are, where we are going, and uh, what direction we're taking. We still have some of the made to worship t-shirts and hoodies uh, that committed. Rashida, wave your hand. Is Christy here? Uh, Lynette, she might be out in the foyer. But see one of them if you would like to purchase one of the shirts or one of the hoodies, and uh, we'll be more than glad to make them available to you. Your end of the year statements are available today. I believe they have them out in the foyer. So if you, uh, if you might have sneaked by them, please go back, and they will be more than glad to give them to you. We want to continue to remember Sister Patricia Sloan in the passing of her sister. Uh, she was funeralized in California on last week. So we, let's pray that Sister Pat made a safe trip and a safe, safe return. Now, we're going to take up a second offering today, ushers. So get your baskets ready. The second offering is in support of the willing workers. And the willing workers are asking each member to donate $20. That's two trips to McDonald's. And that's all. And you'll still owe them. You'll still owe McDonald's if you make two trips. 
So we're going to take up a second offering in, to, in support of our willing workers. Now, some of y'all have gotten so smart, you said, well, I don't bring money to church. You can zail Sister Hartbridge. 214-934-8916. 214-934-8916. Now, if, you, if you're generous and you want to give more than 20 you can give more than 20, but we want to support our willing workers. So now, it's giving time. Malachi, he said, will a man rob God in tithes and in offering? He said, he loves for us to give cheerfully. He don't want to have to twist your arm. He don't want to have to slap you upside the head. He don't want to even have to take it from you. He wants you to be a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. So we're going to ask the ushers at this time to get ready to come down to receive that what you have in store to give to the Lord. And immediately after this offering, we will take up an offering for the willing work. I know I've been changed. You know the angels in heaven done sign my name. You know that I know I've been changed. You know that I know I've been changed. I
Now we're going to take up the second offering in support of our willing workers. Now that phone number again for Sister Hodrich, 214-934-8916. You can zell her if you want to zell her $1,000, $100, or just $20. You might do so. Give us a $2,000 song. <laughs> starts at 1.30, 1.30 p.m. on today. Let us pray. To the great God of heaven who doeth all things well, we thank you so much for income, for jobs, for means of receiving so that we might give back to thee. We thank you so much for what you've done, what you've prepared, and what you've gave, given us, Heavenly Father. And we pray that this money might be used for the building and uplifting of your kingdom. And we pray for the offering that was taken up in support of the willing workers, that it might be used to help build our young folks, to help edify them, and help strengthen them. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before, before we go any further, I'm going to, because i got to go back to the kitchen, so I'm going to ask Brother Worthy and Brother Kathy to come to the, to the, to the roster. And I'm going to ask Brother Patrick Worthy uh, and Brother 
Victor Cathy to come up and stand next to their sons, and they're going to introduce their sons who are our guest speakers on today. So, Brother Worthy, Brother Cathy. Let the church say amen. amen. As always, it is a pleasure to be in this place. Uh, a lot of great memories here, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, that the beautiful, lovely Ruth Wyrick sat under these pews on many a Sundays and sang in the evenings in that gospel hour course. And so I could not stand in this place introducing her grandson without mentioning her name on this morning. Noah Dean Cathy is the son of Victor and Shay Cathy, the 18-year-old who's the oldest of three boys, including twin brothers, Caleb and Luke. Our family attends the Central Point Church of Christ. Noah is a 2024 College Board National African American Scholar and a senior at St. Mark's School of Texas in Dallas. He is the first black editor-in-chief of the Marksman Yearbook, president of the Lion and Sword Society, co-chair of the Inclusion, Diversity, and Leadership Council, and co-president of the Student Alumni Association. Noah is a varsity basketball captain, and he volunteers for the Dallas Mavericks as a ball kid and has accrued more than 300 hours of community service while in high school. He currently serves as the South Central Teen Regional Foundation Chair of Jack and Jill of America, representing the teens in the 32 chapters in our three-state region. In the capacity he led, the Noah Knows Literacy Bring Back the Books campaign, which raised a record-breaking $31,000 to buy books in underserved communities with closed libraries. He plans to major in journalism and currently deciding between the University of Missouri, the University of Texas, and Morehouse College. In three words, Noah is engaging, determined, and a leader. His favorite scripture is Galatians 6, 9. So, let not, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up brothers and sisters. My son, Noah Dean Cathy. Good morning. What an honor to be on this stage and have two great young men who are about to speak. In this day and time, it's just wonderful to see young men that have the goal and the aim of standing in the gap to be leaders, to be individuals who desire to be individuals who proclaim the word of God. Um, Victor just mentioned about uh, his, his uh, mother-in-law standing here or being a part of the worship services here. And I can't help but think that right over here would have been Sister Diesel Taylor. And I was, I was talking to LaShonda this morning. I, I was kind of chiding her, thinking who would have known that some 20 years ago when we first met that we would be coming here uh, to Cedar Crest this morning and you would be watching your son preach and that we just never know what happens and I told her yeah it would have been a wonder or she said it would be a wonderful thing if Granny D would be here to see that and I told her I'm not so sure she won't see it you know I looked I thought back to the the rich man and Lazarus the the Lazarus was able to look back the rich man was able to look back. He wanted to come back and talk to his brothers. So maybe if the rich man could look back and see, and he was not a, a righteous man. I just think there's an argument for those that have gone on to be able to look back and see. So I, I'm, just late, I'm just of the mindset there's more in the scriptures to say they do see it this morning than they don't. But I'm just so very grateful to uh, we have a great affinity for the Kathy family and for, uh, for Noah. We, he's been on vacation with us, and we love him. Uh, just an outstanding young man along with his brothers. I have the honor to introduce our second speaker this morning. 
Patrick Henry Worthy III. Patrick Henry Worthy. He, along with his parents, are members of the Greenville Avenue Church of Christ, where uh, someone very close to him is one of the pulpit ministers. And we are, we are very proud of him and his accomplishments. I don't have the listing of all of his accomplishments, but I, I know these. He's a, a very, uh, he's a very good student, an honor roll student. Uh, he is a, a very, very dutiful individual in all that he does. He is involved in Jack and Jill of America. He is involved in Kudos. He has his own uh, organization uh, that in which he distributes goods to individuals who are in need. Uh, he has been a wonderful friend. He's a confident among his uh, fellow students. I know right now at, the, at this very moment, at this very time, he's involved in a one-on-one -on -one Bible study with one of his classmates where he is a student at Dallas Carter High School, and I'm very proud of that. Just very proud of all the things that he's done, and I'm looking forward to all the things that he will do. Uh, I love to play golf. He is my golf partner, and we've had a wonderful time playing golf, not just being out on the course, but talking about the church, talking about life, talking about different things, and it's, it's a wonderful thing. He's a senior in high school, so He's about to go off to college, so I will soon lose my golf partner. But he'll always be our son. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus went to the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. Peter looked up and he said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elias, and one for thee. But as soon as he spoke those words, there was a voice that came down from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. I want you to hear this one first. And then after he's done, I want you to hear ye him. And we just are thankful again for these young men for their diligence, and we, we salute all young people, not only those that stand in the pulpit, any young person, any young person that is taking a stand for God in the days and the times that we live in, God bless you, and let us encourage them to continue in that fight. Amen. God bless you, Noah. God bless you, Patrick. Amen. Thank, thank you all. Now for communion. Um, what was my, huh? Uh, yes, that's right, that's right. Mm, I am thine, O oh Lord. I have heard thy voice. And it told thy love, thy love to me. me. Oh, but, but I long, long to, long to rise in the arms of, arms of faith, faith and be closer. Closer drawn, drawn to thee. I said, draw me, draw me nearer, draw me nearer. Blessed Lord, to the cross where, where thou hast died. Draw me, said, draw me near, draw me nearer, me nearer, nearer. blessed Lord, to, to, to thy grace, 
Let's prepare our hearts for the Holy Communion. Our communion scripture this morning will be coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. And the Bible reads, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body righteously. Let us give thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you with bowed head and humble hearts. We thank you, Lord, for being a loving God. We thank you, Lord, for being, giving us this opportunity to come together and commune and remember the great sacrifice of your son Jesus upon that cross. Father, we ask you to uh, bless this bread as a symbol of his broken body, and we ask you to bless this cup, which is a fruit of the vine, for the shed blood. Father, we ask you to look at us as being worthy as we have Pure, pure, hand, pure hearts and clean hands. It is in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us together take the uh, communion. This concludes our communion. I am thy Lord. I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to to rise in the arms of in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee said draw me draw me nearer and draw me nearer cross where where thou hast died draw me said draw me nearer draw me nearer Lord I said blessed Lord to to thy that bleed inside I said draw me nearer I said draw me nearer Lord I said nearer 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 to the cross where cross where cross 
If we uh, hear from another one of our young brothers from SWCC, do y'all mind if we hear from the young talent that's coming from that place? Okay, well, come on up, young brother. How y'all doing? I had a student, but I don't see him, so. Oh, it's okay now. It's all right. There you go. It's okay. All right, y'all help me sing this one. Now I'm not a bass, so I just need all the basses. So heaven's on the other side. That's it. The side. Yeah, sing loud. Sing proud. That's it. I will make it. Make it. Sing that one more time. Y'all sound good. Y'all give them a, 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 clap, a clap or something for, it's not easy to sing in front of strangers, at least family members. That's it. Sopranos. yet, no tenors yet, just the sopranos and the basses. Don't that sound good to y'all? This how heaven gonna be. So if you can't convince me, how you gonna convince somebody that it's the flesh and spirit? All right, out it's your turn. Sound good, y'all sound good. I guess the whole church is altos. Uh huh, y'all sound good. Sopranos, altos, and basses. Let's just hear them again. Y'all sound good. Tenors. Heaven's on the other side. Oh, heaven's on the other side. Y'all sound good. Heaven's on the other side. Now, 
if you don't know what part to sing, just wave your hands in the air. your test before I came up here y'all was kind of a little bit but I'm gonna do this for you oh hey it's on the other side you missed it oh heaven oh when the Lord comes you won't be ready heaven I'm gonna give you another chance. Oh, heaven. Oh, heaven. It's on the other side. Yes, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it. I'll make it on home. So Call him up. <laughs> Just call him up. Just call him up. Come on, bass. Just call him up. All my basses. Come on, bass. You louder. Call him up. Mm. Just call him up. One more time. Everybody come say call him and tell. 
what the problem is. Call him a say call. He's gonna lend you. You and me. So just call. He will cast, cast away your doubts and fears. Stop your head, say stop hesitating. I know, I know, God is. So call him up, I said, now call. Call him up, Lord, in prayer. Call him up, call him up, I said, call. Sit and tell, and tell, just what the problem. Just call him up, say, call. Say, call him up, so call. He will cast, he will cast away your doubt and fear. Stop your head, say, stop hesitating. I know I So call him up, I y'all say, call. Call him up, call him up, Lord. Jesus knows, just knows your heart. Everybody does. Say, call him up, say, call. He's a savior, a savior who cares. Just call him up, say, call. Stop hesitating. I know I So call him up by our say call. Call him up, call him up, Lord, in prayer. And my Jesus, I said that Jesus is the prayer. Who's there? Who's there? In all your times of need and when trying. Come. Trials come. Your call, your call. Your call. Said he will. So, so just call. There's no love, no love too big for him to bear. Stop your head, say stop. Hesitating. I know I know. So call him my boy. Call him up, just call him up. Come on, just call him up. Come on, baby, just call him up. Come on, just call him up. Me y'all. I hear you a lot. A little bit loud. Just call him up. Come on, just call him up. Uh huh. Everybody say, call him up and tell. Just call him up by your say, call. Said he will lend you, you and you. Call him up by your say, call. He will cast, he will cast away your doubts and fears. Stop your head, say stop hesitating. I know, I know God is. So call him up, you y'all say call. Call him up, call him up, Lord, in prayer. Say Jesus is a friend, yo. Jesus is a friend. Who's there? Who's there? Y'all don't believe this. And when trials come, your call, your call, your call, he will hear. So just call. There's no low, there's no low too big for him to bear. 
so stop your head, say stop hesitating. I know I, my God is going, yeah. oh, just call, call him up, call him up, Lord, in prayer. Call him up, say call. I did not mean to go there. That's all right. Tell Jesus what the problem is. I y'all sick call. You and he. So I sick call. He will care. Away. And I said, stop, hesitate, stop, hesitate. So call him up in your Call him up, Lord, in prayer. I said, I just call to say I love you. Said, I just call to say how much I care. And I said, I just called to say, I love you. And I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Yeah, said, I just called to say, to say, to say, I love you. Said I just call to say I love you, and I mean, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Mm, said that I just call. Sam, my name is Noah Cappy. Um, I was my, my dad brought up my grandmother in, her introdu in my introduction today, um, and I thought about her a lot the past couple of days preparing for this. Um, she loved three things, amongst many, but really three things: um, preaching. She would sit in church forever, um, preaching, um, us, her grandsons, and Southwestern. And so this is the culmination of all of those three things. And so I know that she she is really really proud today. I want to thank Brother Morrison in his absence, um, obviously. Uh, this is his church, and he has served as a mentor and a leader uh, to me um, for the course of my life. Um, and so to be able to stand in his pulpit is an honor. Sister Hodridge, obviously, who is taking up the mantle after my grandmother as one of the foremost supporters of Southwestern. And so I know she is proud of the work that you and the willing workers are doing. And, of course, my family is here, my mother, my father, Caleb and Luke, my uncle. Um, and this is my best friend, one of my closest friends that I'm fortunate enough to have the stage with today. This is a story that will probably come up. So I'm going to beat my parents to it. Um, Patrick, I was born in September um, of 05, and he was born April of 06. But at my baby shower, baby shower for my mom, Patrick's mom actually told her um, that she was pregnant. And I, I believe it when I hope they're boys, and I hope they can be friends. Um, and here we are almost 19 years later, um, and I think that prophecy came true. Um, so... Um, and enough of the thank yous. Thank, obviously, thank you all. Um, Cedar, this is the second time I've spoken to Cedar Crest, and so this church means a lot to my family and definitely holds a special place in my heart. To the text for today, Jeremiah 29 and 11, a verse I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, but I'll read it for you anyway. 
I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It says, for I know the plans I have for you. This is the declaration of the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans for well-being, not disaster, and to give you a hope and a future. Uh, I'm in a class right now at St. Mark's. I'm a senior at St. Mark's, and it's called Creative Writing. Um, and in creative writing, uh, we write, we create, and we also analyze other works to further our own skill. And the epitaph of creative writing, the analysis portion, um, is a man who eats a whole meal at one time is foolish. It is best if he breaks it up into parts. And so taking from that epitaph um, and applying to this verse, if you bear with me for a moment, I'd like to break this verse into three clauses. Um, if, if you read it, it's three clauses. Find all the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Can you oh, there we go. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, and plans to give you a hope in the future. And so Jeremiah, the writer, begins, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. This is Jeremiah's letter to um, the exiles there about to enter into 70 years, the Bible says, 70 years in Babylon before God brings them out on the other side. But for I know the plans I have for you. Um, Jeremiah is specific. God is specific. If you read the Bible, it's intentional. Um, God is detailed. It's his divinely inspired word. He's also very direct. And so for I know the plans I have for you actually refers to you. Um, I know this is true because Jeremiah 28 books earlier says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Um, and before you were born, I consecrated you in your mother's womb. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah, um, in 29th book, or 29th chapter of his book, excuse me, is only saying, I know the plans I have for you because God's already revealed that to him in his life. God is making it crystal clear that the plans he has for you are not the plans he has for us. I'll say that again. God is making it crystal clear here that the plans he has for you are not the plans he has for us. Jeremiah is writing to a multitude of people in this verse. Um, there's thousands of them, a lot of them. And he uses the word you specifically, saying, I know the plans I have for you. He could have said you, the nation. Um, he could have said the people, the multitude, other words that he uses in this book. But in verse 11, he says, I know the plans I have for you. This is something that we have Christians has, we have Christians has a difficult time comprehending. One, because we are designed for community. Like, God made a community for all of us to benefit. And we think we are designed for common goals. But that is not the case. I'm in creative writing. I brought that up earlier. And I told a short story. We're writing short stories right now. We're in our short story unit. Uh, one of my classmates wrote a story about a group of eight scientists who wrote a, whose goal is to write a prize-winning essay on string theory. Um, at the start of the school year, the eight scientists come together and they say, our goal is to win this competition. They're working tirelessly, super hard. And at the end of the first quarter, one of them, named Alex, he quits. He changes majors, leaving complex science for economics, finance, something like that. And what he tells the group is that I am destined for something else. Now, I'm not an expert in theology or scripture breakdown by any means. But if I had to guess, Alex knows something that he wishes his friends knew. And this is the... First point of this verse, he says, the you in Jeremiah 29, verse 10, Jeremiah 29, verse 10 says, this is what the Lord says, when 70 years in Babylon are complete, I will attend you and will, conform, and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore this place. Jeremiah 29, verse 10, the you is collective. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, the you is singular. Jeremiah 29, 10 is referring to them as the masses, the multitude, all of the people. But Jeremiah 29, 11 is specific to each and every one of us. The other scientists in Alex's group are still stuck in verses 9 and 10 saying, this is for all of us. How could you abandon us? How could you leave us? But he's knowing that. 29, verse, chapter 29, verse 11 is talking to him specifically. That the, the, the plan that he has for us is not the plan that he always has for our group. God intentionally uses, utilizes the word you so it can be both communal in verses 1 through 10 and then individual from 11 to 32. Um, and that, that is the first lesson in the clause, and the second is similar to it. In this same story, around December, um, the local news station profiles this group of now seven scientists, the work that they're doing, the hard work they're trying to accumulate, and one of them, or two of them, are the better spokespeople of the seven group. They're all scientists, but two of them are better at speaking in public, and so two of them go on TV, and one of them, her name is Abby, she's offered a job from, for, for NASA, um, to be a complex science theorist in the NASA laboratory. And it's an offer that she can't refuse. And so this frustrates now the six scientists left because she left them for something else. 
uh, of the same kind, but something different. And this is the second lesson of the first clause. Just because we're going in the same direction doesn't mean we have the same end point. Um, this is a lot of people that are all going in the same direction. God is putting them all through the same suffering, but all of their suffering won't end at the same time. You know, you, you, I'm again driving. You ever drive and there's like a car next to you for a really long time? You're like, huh, I wonder if they're going the same place that I am. Like, the odds of that are very low because even though you're using the same highways, the same streets, the same exits, you aren't always going to the same place. Um, the second clause is that God has plans to prosper us and not to harm us. I have a hard time believing um, people who say that God will keep you from all suffering and that God will bring you through suffering really quickly. Um, one, because despite being only 18, I think my life has had some suffering. Um, I'm a columnist for our school newspaper, one of the best in the nation. I've published eight columns so far. Um, among them, one of them is about a friend that died that came out on Friday. One of them is about my grandparents who passed away two in one year. One is about the difficulty of being black in an all-white environment. One of them is about the impact of the death of my heroes. And so half of my columns involve trial and hardship. And being the newspaper we are, we have a big audience. And one of the alumni from my school um, asked me, he said, you write really well, son, but how have you gone through so much at 18? It seems like you've been through a lot for someone so young. And I didn't know how to respond. But I think he thought that Sorrow and long suffering is not for those so young, that it will go away soon for those of us who are unable to hand it. And then, then he asked if I was a Christian. And I don't know what he was thinking, but maybe he believed that I couldn't believe in God if I had been exposed to so much trauma. And that's false hope. It's abounded, it abounded in Jeremiah's day, and it abounds today as well in the mouths of prophets and philosophers that don't believe in the true teaching. Um, this is not out there. This is mainstream common theology that is drawing supposedly from Christian crowds and all around. And if by chance, this is what they'll say, if by chance you, for some reason, find yourself suffering, right, maybe even because of lack of faith, or if you will only return to God, your suffering will go away. Believe this, claim this, trust that prosperity is coming, tell yourself this power of positive thinking, even have faith is what they'll say. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, I know the plans I have for you. God uses the word prosper, and we think that's maybe prosper financially or otherwise. If you're suffering right now, you need to believe that prosperity is coming soon because that's what the Bible says. But I'd be cautious of this line of thinking. We often confuse God's unwillingness to harm us with his ability to bring us through harmful situations. In reality, Jeremiah 29, 11 teaches the exact opposite. Of what, that, of what many believe it says. God's people are in exile according to God's will. And according to God's word, their suffering in exile is not coming to an end any time soon. God doesn't promise us a quick or easy transition through suffering. He promises that he will walk through us with it. Now, you might think, okay, I like the other message better. I hope I could get through it really soon. Which is exactly what people in Jeremiah's day were thinking too. It's why they believed in false prophets and false God. And God is saying to us right now that exact same thing that he said to them, don't believe it. Don't put your hope in the crowd. Don't listen to words that ease your soul and please you soon. Why? Because they're not from God. Jeremiah, the prophet of God, says, here is true hope. Follow this. Your hope is not that God to, will keep you from all suffering. That's not at all what Jeremiah teaches. Jeremiah says that God wills God will bring us through it with him. And we've seen this, like the context of Jeremiah, they made it through. And God makes it crystal clear that suffering is a reality for God's people in this fallen world. And, God, and we as God's people will not escape it. But in the middle of suffering, I pro God promises to enable us to endure it. And God is not promising, God is not promising that it, it will end in a short time, as I said. And then when it does happen, when we do get through, there are times... Now we think back, it's how did that last so long? Why was I going through this? Why am I the one that had to endure this? And there were just other questions, other questions in our faith, like is my faith strong enough? Does God hear and see me? Does God exist at all sometimes? And if he is there, can his faith be trusted? When, God's, when God never promised us in his word, God gives us a lot of promises. He never promised us that our suffering would end in a short time 
The suffering of his own son led him to death. Why would ours be so quick? You might ask, well, what did God promise us along these lines? This is a great segue to the final clause. Um, he promises us plans to give us a hope and a future. The answer, though not as popular as the theology I gave you earlier, is clear. True hope, God promises, our suffering will end in the long term. Exile will not be the end of you, God tells us. Your suffering will not have the last word. I have good plans for you. You realize what this means, what it meant for the people in Jeremiah's day, and what it means for us today, that God's plan calls for us to have patience and to trust in him. We can't bank on the fact that it will end soon or that we'll get through it quick. God hasn't said that, no matter how good it sounds. And I'm not going to say it to you from this pulpit, no matter how many crowds say it amongst you. What God says is that when suffering, sometime, when suffering comes, sometimes suffering stays for a little while. 70 years is a long time to wait. Now I know many of you in the audience saying 70 years is not that long, I'm not that old. 70 years is a long time to wait. Most of us would like our problems to work out by the end of the work day or the week, not the end of the century. Which is why these false prophets were so appealing then and so appealing now too. It is why prosperity teaching is popular, but it's a lie. What is true is that God is calling his people through his word to patient trust. It is possible that suffering could end soon in that situation, that healing, healing might happen soon. And should we pray for it? Yes. By the grace of God and the power of God, God can do anything he wants to on his own timing. But 70 years is like three to five business days for a God who made the universe. Absolutely, by the grace of God, we can get through it. But there's a, a second question that arises from this, is that if God promises to see the end of suffering, and 70 years is a long time, all of us didn't make it. All of them didn't make it to the other side of the 70 years. In fact, most of them didn't make it. Generations of people weren't able to see the other side of their suffering in Babylon, but God only promises a, God only promises us a hope and a future. He, he never said where that future will be. Now, Noah, what are you saying? I'm saying that God promises us a future. He guarantees us that whether it's here on earth or with him in heaven. Those of us who believe in him are guaranteed to see that hope in that future. And all of us, we hope to experience it here on earth with our friends and family, but some of us will experience our hope and future up with him. Death is not suffering, often the opposite. Death is the end of our suffering. Those people, most of them didn't see the other side of verse 11, but that doesn't mean God didn't keep his promise. You know it's possible to die in the Lord. Romans says that if we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, we die in the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. We are guaranteed a hope in the future. Jeremiah 29, 11 is a verse I think about a lot these days on the brink of independent life, trying to decide which college to go to or which major to do or which program to apply for. Even greater than that, who am I going to hang out with? What parties will I go to? Where would I want to live? What do I want to do? And Jeremiah 29, 11 gives me the assurance that, yes, God will get me through, but also that he promises something on the other side. We live in a world where little is guaranteed. Nothing is for certain. Everything is always up in the air, and I don't know a lot of things. I can't tell the future. I have no clue what tomorrow or the next week or the next year holds, but I do know this. Whatever God brings me to, he will bring me through. Whatever I enter into, God will bring me out of. Even though it won't always be promising, we will always be prosperous. Um, I was at Sky Ranch, my last year at Sky Ranch, and going into um, eighth grade. And on Thursday night, we have Morph. Uh, Morph is a program for us who are in the seventh and, or eighth, seventh, eighth and ninth grades. And we go, we have like a travel competition. They split us into two groups. And on the Thursday morning, we walk through like the woods. Sky Ranch is a 500 acre campus. And we walk through the woods and we organize together our half of the group and we meet um, in this open place in the woods. We have a lot of fun. We do a lot of cool things together. And we're walking to that path. We're being led by a couple of counselors. It's, it's a long path. Sky Ranch is really big. Um, it's like 500 acres, as I said. But most of it is dedicated to the camp. And a lot of it is forest. A lot of lakes, a lot of trees, a lot of all that stuff. And we're walking through. We're trying to find a place for us to meet out here in this pretty crowded area. And so we're walking like 10 minutes or so, which is a long time for a lot of seventh graders. Um, we're walking, and we get to this spot. It's empty. It's clear. There's trees surrounding it. There's nothing on the ground. The ground is brown. It's like, perfect. This is a place for us to be. We can go hang out. And our counselor says, 
No, we're going to keep walking. And now for us, we were like, no, like, turn to your right. Look at what we're seeing. It's empty. That's good for us. We can go there. And what the counselor is saying is, no, what you don't know is that the land that you just looked at used to be trees. There used to be stuff there. That was burned to the ground. That harbors dead things. Why would you want to go volunteer yourself to wake amongst dead things? If you keep walking a little bit longer, got something on the other side, we keep walking about a mile more or so, almost an hour after that, and we enter a land full of trees, full of branches, full of seats for us, food, fire, all the things we wanted. And if we would have stopped after the first 10 minutes, if we would have stopped where the ground was dead, where the forest had been burned to the ground, where life was no more, we wouldn't have got to the other side. In John 13, while he's washing feet, Jesus says, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but someday you will. This is a remark coming from Jesus while he's washing Peter's feet. Um, there's a very statue of this encounter on Brother Morrison's desk. Um, and this is a lesson from that verse. There are moments in life where God plans, God's plan seems unscrutable. It doesn't make sense to us as humans. We are sure what God is doing. We find ourselves in places where we don't understand. And we question why certain things are happening. It's in these moments that we need to remember the words of Jesus in John 13 which are very similar to the words in Jeremiah, if you read them close enough. Jesus says, you don't know what I'm doing now, but someday you will. Jeremiah, through the voice of God, says, I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to get you through what you're going through. Both of these situations, Jesus and God, are in control of the situation. And though we don't know it yet, we will benefit from whatever is waiting for us on the other side. In this verse, Peter, Jesus is speaking to Peter, who was confused about why God is washing his feet, why Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, is washing his feet, a humble task typically performed by a servant. And Jesus knows what lies ahead. And he tells Peter that he might not understand now, but he will later. If I could offer you one piece of advice today, it's that you might not understand what's going on now, but you will later. We can trust in his divine orchestration, knowing that he is working all things out for our good. He never promised to. He never abandoned us. And he hasn't and he won't. He hasn't forgotten us. He would, leave, uh, he would leave to go get us even if everybody else was in place. Like Peter, sometimes we are confused. We don't always understand the plan of God or understand God's plan in the present. But his ways are higher than ours. The Bible says his, surpanding, his understanding surpasses ours. God's actions, his lack of actions or his silence is all on purpose. It's crucial during these times to hold on to our faith and trust God's process, even when we don't understand. So today, I charge you to embrace the uncertainty of now. Even though you might not know what you're going through or why you're going through it or how you're going to make it on the other side, if God can bring thousands of people through 70 years of torture and abandonment and slavery, God can get you through the work week. God will get you through your marriage problems. God will get you through the tough school week. God will get you through the test. God will get you through hardship. God will get you through the grief. God will get you through everything because God got them through this. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you and I love you. We'll start with that, God. If, if nothing else, if you didn't do anything else, God, what you've brought us through would already be enough. We don't know all the things that you've protected us from or helped us elude and evade God, but we do know this, that because we love and praise and serve you, God, that you promised to bring us through. You have plans, God, to prosper us, not to harm us, plans to give us a hope in the future, God. You guarantee us that. You guarantee us to see what's on the other side, whether it's here or it's in heaven, God, and we thank you for that. We love you, God. We thank you for sending down your son, Jesus who gave his own life, that we might be able to love you and serve you. And God, he became sin. He became flesh. He took on all of our sins, all of our mistakes, all of our mishaps. God, we thank you for that. We thank you for allowing him to bring us closer to you. God, and I close with this, God, we may not know what you're doing all the time. Most of the time, we probably won't. But we know that we are in the hands of the person who made the universe and if he can wind the stars together and he can put the earth exactly where it needs to be, if he can 
build mountains and create valleys and seas, if he can make us, then he can make us able to get through whatever we're going through. God, we thank you that we love you. And our goal is simple. We are better people tomorrow than we try to be today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen again. Amen. Certainly it is a blessing to be in the house of the Lord on this morning. I'm just thankful just to be able to share the pulpit with my brother and just be able to hear some words of encouragement, some words of inspiration and share some with you all this morning. Um, I bring you greetings from the Greenville Avenue Church of Christ in Richardson, Texas. And if you don't mind, I want to recognize any members with Green, uh, from Greenville who are here with us today, would you please stand? Amen. Said so you, you know when you make the drive from Richardson to Oak Cliff, you got some faithful members in the body of Christ. Amen. But we are all one in the body of Christ. It doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter where I am. I'm going to worship the same way as if I was over there this morning. And I also want to give a thanks to Sister Hodridge and Brother Morrison for setting this up and just giving us a platform just to be able to speak from a youth Christian perspective. Um, I won't be long. Uh, I know um, y'all are used to, uh, I won't be long being about 30 minutes. Uh, I won't be long is about 12 minutes today, uh, uh, but I'm going to be effective in my teaching. Um, so this morning, the lesson is directed towards the youth. If you will, turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4 in verse number 12. 1st Timothy chapter 4 in verse number 12. The Bible says, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on the hands by the presbytery. Take heed unto thyself and unto doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. I want to lift up a title for this morning, Young but Ready to Be an Example. Young but Ready to Be an Example. Looking at the book of Timothy, I believe this passage is a very powerful text, and it applies to all children in the body of Christ. Paul is making a statement to Timothy, telling him how he ought to live even in his young age, many times taking him around with him and showing him his teaching, showing him people he has had to deal with but also showing him the way people may treat you for living a life after Christ. 
Not only that, but he is showing Timothy that God has specific requirements for those who follow after him. And as I read this passage, I can really relate to Timothy because Timothy is a young preacher. He is a man who has grown up knowing the scriptures. The Bible tells us in from a child thou has known the scriptures which were able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Paul gives Timothy the direction and he shows, them, he shows him the importance of a young Christian believer who strives to be what God has called him to be. So when we look at the text, the Bible says, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Paul is suggesting to Timothy that you are young. But because of your knowledge and because of the way you represent yourself, you are ready to be a light because you are an example by the way you live. So Paul, he gives us specific instructions on how we are to live. He says in word, I should be an example in word. I should be able to teach the word. I should be able to teach the word to someone who is not familiar with the word of God. He says in love, having a love for God and showing honor to God through my works. He says in faith, being faithful in all the things that I do, trusting in him and loving on him through all my circumstances. And he says in conversation. I display an encouraging and a helpful attitude. My, my light should not dim to those around me. When, when, when I see people, people, people shouldn't say, oh, oh, there goes Patrick. He calls himself a Christian, but he goes around disrespecting everybody. One of the things I, I've tried to do in my life is to live a life that God has desired from me. In a dark room, I've tried to be that light to someone else. This girl came up to me in school, watch it, and said, she said, she said, Pat, there's just something different about you. You're just different from all the other people in here. Now, young man, that'll make you start feeling yourself. But you may very well be the only Bible that people read. <laughs> Meaning, you may not see it, but people are really observant of your life. Some of my friends around school, they go around calling me Pastor Pat. <laughs> Having my contact name saved as Pastor Pat. Now, now I don't agree with the pastor part, okay, but you get the point, and they'll ask me for a word of the day, and I'll, I'll give them a verse because a whole lot of people up there need it. But when, when, but when I'm living out the purpose of God, people ought to see something different in me. I, I shouldn't be living the same as everybody. I shouldn't be talking the same as everybody. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse number 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, I, I'll cling to things that are new. I have new ends. I, I have new purposes. My, my soul and my mind and my body conjoins to new life in Christ Jesus. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 1, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which that are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of the throne of God. I'm not seeking the things of this world. I'm not worried about the wicked ways of this world because I seek the things that which are above because my authority is not in this world, but it is in Christ Jesus. Look what he says. 
in verse number 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, we are ambassadors of Christ. What is an ambassador? It means I, I am entrusted to send out a message given to me by another authority. So once I realize that my purpose is to spread the good news of the gospel, I then start to live out the purpose that God has set for me. So how do I learn to live the right way? Look at the text. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 13, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. You know, I think of this Bible as an instruction manual. You, you can use it and it will be real beneficial to you in completing your task. Or you could choose not to, but you could spend time trying to figure out what pieces go with what when the project wasn't designed by you in the first place. The same is with our Christian life. I can't expect to fulfill my task as a Christian. How can I be directed if I'm not being directed by the source? And this is very important because if I'm not giving my time to this, then what is consuming my time? One of the ministers of our church, she said a few weeks ago, you can't be your natural self in the body of Christ. There are some things that God asks you to do that do not come naturally. You have to choose to forgive. You have to choose to love. You have to choose to live faithfully. You have to choose to learn more about God through reading for yourself. But when we do these things, all God is doing is shaping us to become more like his son. The Bible says, take heed unto thyself and unto doctrine, continuing in, continuing in them. This thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. What is God saying and what is God communicating? Once I understand that, I will be able to save myself and those that, those that I teach. I want to leave you with one scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 10. The Bible says, you, however, know all of my teaching, my way of life, my purpose. He's talking to Timothy. He's saying, my faith my patience, my love, my endurance, the persecutions and the sufferings, what kinds of things that happened to me in Antioch and Ichium and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. You may have some trials. You may have some difficulties in this life. People are not always going to agree with you for your beliefs, but look what the Bible says. He said, but as for you, I'm talking to the young people, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of because you know those from whom you've learned it. This word has delivered me time and time again. Look what, look what Paul says to Timothy. He, said, he says, and from infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which were able to make you wise through salvation, through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God breath and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This Bible right here. The life that you live is going to help you. But what good is the word if it's not living inside of me?
you may feel the need to come forth. And maybe you have not been living a life that is pleasing in God's sight. And you want to restart with God and put your life on in baptism. You may be young, but you are ready. I tell you a few days ago, I mean not a few days ago, a few years ago, I had surgery on my nose because I wasn't getting enough air through one side of my nose. And the doctor, before they put you in surgery, they, they, they take this anesthesia and they put it in your arm to make you fall asleep before the surgery. And when I woke up from the surgery, I was in the same place as I was when I started before. And I asked my parents, when, when do we start? My mom said, oh, the procedure is over. You must have got some good sleep. The same is in our Christian life. The whole time I'm submerged in the water, I may not see what God is doing, but he is working in my life. He's taken away the guilt. He's, he's taken away the shame. He's, he's taken away all the things that I'm going through, and he makes my life whole again. I hope I've said something that has been beneficial to the youth, and maybe not the youth, but everybody in here. If you want to obey the gospel, you first have to hear it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17, so faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, you got to believe it. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. You have to repent. Repent of your sins. Luke tells us in Luke chapter 13 and verse number 3, I tell you nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish, confess of your sins. Bible says, for without a heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and without the mouth, confesseth is made unto salvation, and be baptized. Bible says, Mark 16, chapter 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I want to live a life that is pleasing and acceptable in God's sight. And maybe you just need to come forth because you need prayer. You want God to direct your life in a way that is pleasing and acceptable. All you have to do is come forth and we'll pray for you. One more verse I wanted to share. But it's all right. You are young, but you are ready. God has called the old and He calls the youth the same. We are all members in the body of Christ and we all have the right to be an example. God uses us for all his good works, for he knows the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. May God bless you. May God keep you. Amen. Said all of my trials, all my, all my trials. Say oh my care, all of my care. I can tell them, say I can tell them to my Lord and hear my burden. We're going through the 
There was a songwriter that said, I believe the children are the future. There's been some praying parents and some praying grandparents that, that have laid on their heart Jeremiah 29 11. We've been blessed today. Thank you, Noah Dean, Kathy. If you're a part of the willing workers, if you have been a part of the willing workers, will you please stand? Willing workers, will you please stand? The willing workers have been working, and, and you can see the impact. Dr. Hodridge would want you to recognize that Southwestern Christian College Chorus is here today. Let's lift them up in prayer. Will y'all please stand? Southwestern Christian College Chorus. Keep these young people in your prayers. And then we had P3 who came our way and he dropped a dime on us. And, 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 and he put a nickel with it. And, 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 and if you know it, he, turned, he, he showed you how to turn 15 cents into a, a whole dollar in the Lord. You just come to the Lord. Uh, Paul was a seasoned saint who was in the prison, and he thought enough of his son in the ministry, Timothy, to write to him, to give him direction as he gave him the assignment to head up the church. He, 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 he said, despite his youth, he can do it because of his knowledge. Uh, and as we spent time in the scriptures, both of these young men took us through the scriptures that we might be better equipped to be the Bible that people see as we walk down the street, as we enter and clock in at our workplace, as we check into the home front and interact with family and friends. We are better equipped because of this day, because the willing workers asked these two young men to come by our way. And let's hear the responses uh, to the word from the word. Charlotte Washington requests prayers. She asks for continued prayers as she is having issues regarding her health and prayers. She's asking also for prayers for her family. Sister Tony Crawford sent in a prayer request asking that we pray for her nephew, Sebastian. Sebastian fell at school and has a concussion. And so the Crawford family, uh, Cedric, the father, Aquanet, the mother, are not here with us today as Aquanet and Sebastian's twin sister, Allison, is not feeling well as well. So we want prayers for that family. I, I'm, Again, uh, Sister Hydra's asked for prayers for the Southwestern Christian College Chorus, and we're glad that y'all are here and will be featured in this afternoon's program. Sister Marquita Cookie Osieko requests prayers for the entire Osieko family, and she especially asks for traveling grace for the DFW Osieko family who will be traveling back from the greater Houston area in the Osiecos in Houston. Brother Alonzo Verser requests prayers. He requests prayers for his mother who's battling cancer. He says that she's currently out of the hospital, but she's still not feeling well. Please lift her up. And he's asking uh, this will be taken away from her soon. Amen. Sister Shelby Gooden comes on behalf of, comes in prayer requests on behalf of Sister Sherma Thomas. Sister Thomas is battling over her physical therapy regimen. Um, the treatment, uh, they would like to go uh, and have physical therapy done with Sister Thomas. And of course, Medicare is asking that they do something different. So Shelby is requesting prayer that provisions, guidance, and acceptance will guide them through. Our prayers are with you, uh, Sister Shelby and Sister Thomas. Cheryl Neely with our 
Death Ministries, asking prayers for her baby niece, that she'll grow up to learn about God. Amen for that prayer. Brother Greg, I'm going to ask that you uh, close out in prayer. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you with bowed head and humble hearts. Thank you for what our eyes have seen and what our ears have heard. Lord, we ask you to keep blessing these young men as they pursue their Christian walk and try to reflect and be the light that people can see them as, as being Christians and try to help those that are in need of help. Father, we thank you for this time we had to come in this house and worship you in spirit and truth. Father, we pray that our conduct and participation was pleasing unto you. Father, we have those who have responded, those who have asked for prayer, Lord. We lift these prayers and situations up to you, Lord, praying that you are the only one that can help us in these conditions. There's nothing that we go through is bigger than you. Father, we continue to ask you to pray to bless this congregation, bless all the leadership and those who, who are walking, trying to be better Christians, Lord. Father, we, as we um, prepare to end this service and be able to go out and still continue to be a light and shine for you, we ask you to continue to bless us all. We all go through things that's uncomfortable, but we know that you are there with us as we go through these things. Father, bless us and keep us. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you know, this is Willing Workers Sunday. So um, we would like to have our guests from Southwestern Christian College to proceed back to um, the fellowship hall for, for, dinner, for lunch. We're going to reassemble for, at, by 1.15 to begin our service promptly at 1.30. Um, with that thought in mind, let's go ahead and bless the food uh, for the nourishment of our body. Heavenly Father, we come to you as humbly as you know how, thankful for this day that wasn't promised. Lord, we're thankful for those hands that are in the kitchen, Lord, preparing this meal for the nourishment of our bodies. Lord, we ask that your blessing be upon uh, this nourishment that we might uh, enjoy it, Lord. May we enjoy not just the food, but the fellowship. And Lord, have a little bit of Christian fun. Heavenly Father, then as we come back to celebrate our beloved institution, Southwestern Christian College, Lord, may the things that we do be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. It's in Christ's name that offer this prayer guided by the Spirit.